Hello and welcome to My Career in Data, a podcast where we would discuss with industry leaders and experts how they have built their careers. I'm your host, Shannon Kemp, and today we're talking to Christopher Berg from Data Kitchen. With a robust catalog of courses offered on demand and industry-leading live online sessions throughout the year, the Dataversity Training Center is your launchpad for career success. Browse the complete catalog at training.dataversity.net and use code DVTALKS for 20% off your purchase. Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Officer at Dataversity and this is My Career in Data, a Dataversity Talks podcast dedicated to learning from those who have careers in data management, to understand how they got there and to be talking with people who help make those careers a little bit easier. To keep up to date in the latest in data management education, go to dataversity.net forward slash subscribe. Today, we are joined by Chris Berg, the CEO and head chef at Data Kitchen. And normally, this is where a podcast host would read a short bio of the guest. But in this podcast, your bio is what we're here to talk about. Chris, hello and welcome. Hi, Shannon. How are you today? Thanks for having me. Oh, thanks for being here. So excited you can be here. Um, I had the pleasure of introducing you at a recent Data Diversity Demo Day. And as I was reading your bio, I'm like, oh my gosh, you've done some really cool things. I can't wait to dive into it <laughs> and hear yeah, about how you like got into it. Winding road, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so well, let's start though, where you are now and what you're currently doing. So you're the CEO and head chef. I love that title at Data Kitchen. So tell me what type of business is Data Kitchen? So we're a software company. Um, we do some data work on the side, but we uh, and um, I guess we we've really been devoted to solving a problem in data that's not with data. It's a problem in in how the teams work with data, and so uh, we've called that idea data ops, and it came really from my, my career and my co-founder's career, um, and so we've been um, you know I guess to the, the, the short speech is that I I, I think data and analytic people are frustrated. I don't think they're being very successful. I think there's a lot of waste and inefficiency. And I don't think it's solved by um, buying a new ETL tool or a faster database. I think like a lot of cases, it's actually solved by how the people work with each other and how the people work with the system as a whole. Um, And um, that it's a taking a series of ideas that were started up in manufacturing with Toyota and went through software development with Agile. And, and, and we sort of took those ideas and have nested them in the data and analytics world. And we've got some software to help, but we also have written uh, two books and have a training program and manifestos. We have a little content farm that talks about these ideas. Oh, very cool. So, um, so as the Data Kitchen CEO and head chef, <laughs> what does your typical week look like? What are you doing for the company? Oh, uh, so I, I guess to me, I think leadership is a service role, right? And so I, I try to do what other people don't. Uh, and I try to set it up so my team is successful, my customers are successful, and and we're making the right, you know, big picture calls. Um, and so, but I also uh, am an engineer, right? So some of the time... I miss coding, so I find ways to code uh, a few hours a week if I can. Um, that's always like a pleasure if I can actually do technical work because I miss that. But I, I find my job is really just talking. It's, it's communicating. And so um, that has been a big change because I spent sort of the first part of my career as a software engineer, sort of writing code for um, a laboratory at MIT, at NASA, at some startup companies at Microsoft. Um, and then I got into management and the data field relatively late, like um, 18 years ago, um, and uh, uh, found that that was just very challenging. And I've been kind of working on solving that challenge ever, ever since in various different ways. So it's it's a lot of um, it's a lot of communication and, and leadership, which is a very different set of skills than the, the sort of heads down um, I can make the machine do what I want, and I'm really happy to spend eight hours doing it. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, and it's it's just a very different set of skills, um, and and that's something I had to learn in my career. 
Well, you've, well, you've mentioned some buzzwords already, so let's let's get into how you got to where you are, and then I have lots of questions uh, to follow up with. So, um, so tell me, Chris. So, when is is this? Was this a dream? So, say you're six years old. Was this a dream? Like, I want no, to. No, no, I was going to be an astronaut. Chef. I was going to be <laughs> oh, an astronaut nice. and yeah. like go to yeah. space. That was the dream, right? And then <laughs> it transitioned for a while. And in middle school and high school, I wanted to be a war photographer and be oh. one of those cool guys running around. And then, uh, um, and then sort of, you know, I, I I grew up as a working class kid in Wisconsin, right? So I worked my way through college. Um, and then, um, I, you know, I bounced around. I did a lot of math and science things. I sort of took a lot of liberal arts classes. And then I just wanted to get out of Wisconsin. Um, and I, I wanted to fly in a plane. It was very important for me. I hadn't fl flown in a plane or really left Wisconsin very much. So I went to the Peace Corps. Um, and I was a teacher for two and a half years in a rural school in Botswana. And so I taught math. Um, and that was just a great experience for me. Um, if anything can help your communication skills, it's um, teaching. <laughs> it's teaching middle school and high school kids. Uh, so I learned quite yeah. a bit there uh, and I came back and then I went to um, graduate school and I sort of fell in love with, I, I realized that I I was sort of tired of being poor. You know, it's been almost seven, eight years kind of living on my, living off of my own, you know, kind of being financially on my own. And, um, and then second is I just really got interested in software and computers and, and actually AI. Uh, and this was the very late eighties. So I went to Columbia for a graduate school and then I was, uh, got a job at, for five years, um, at this project from a laboratory at MIT and NASA to automate air traffic control, um, to actually learn how to sequence and space aircraft faster. And it turns out that I just read an article in the New York Times that um, we need that more than ever because a lot of air traffic controllers are retiring and they've had an increase in accidents because they're working overtime. So automation can help. And I learned a lot of lessons about working on teams. Um, and then, you know, the internet revolution happened. I thought I'd get rich and retire in two years. In 96, that didn't happen. Um, and uh, so I've been you know, on, on this career of being technical and then sort of talking and, and, and managing and leading, that's sort of been my career cycles between individual contributor and team lead and, and working my way around that. Tell me, so, okay, so you decided, you know, you go to the Peace Corps, which is very cool, great experience teaching math. So how did you come back and transition into getting interested in, in, it was it just you just decided you're going to pick up any degree in in for your master's? Um, well, I, th I thought I was going to get a master's degree and then like go back and teach again. Like I thought I'm getting mm -hmm. a master's in math. I'll go teach again. I like teaching. And then I got to New York and I like I really had no money. And like it was very tough to be in New York um, and poor. And so yeah. I just like, you know, I worked my way through college and it's like seven or eight years of like really like not may have a lot of money. And I was like, I like uh, I, I, teaching's great, but then I sort of got frustrated with teaching, and I just really got into the. Um, but for some, uh, you know, I have a son now, and I had my son turns out the same way. I had a lot of um, confidence that wasn't backed up with any experience. <laughs> I just thought I'd be really good at it, like, and I have no experience. Honestly, I was like, oh, I'm going to be really good at computers, even though I kind of hadn't done that much before then. And uh, you know, it turned out I was right. And I guess, uh, you know, and I don't know if that's some genetic thing or some male thing, but like I have a 23 year old son who has a lot of confidence with very little uh, actual experience to back it up. <laughs> Maybe it's uh, testosterone. I don't know what it is. But... <laughs> oh, I love it. So, okay. And you got into AI. Was that before you got to the MIT project or during Yeah, it was sort of, uh, this is before. Yeah, I took a lot of sort of machine learning and neural networks courses in graduate school. Um, and then there wasn't, at that time, AI was very unfashionable. It, had, it was in the mm -hmm. AI winter. And um, <laughs> what's interesting from my perspective about AI now is that I really was trying to, with network computers and workstations and algorithms, uh, trying to get a computer to do what an air traffic controller does, right? It's kind of like self-driving self -driving air traffic automation, right? It's the same sort of problem. Yeah. And uh, what we learned is that you, you, can do, you can solve it. It's 
sort of 90, 85, 90% of the time. But every time you want to go up to the other next percent, it gets almost asymptotically harder. It's like really hard to go from 90% accurate than 91, then 92, 93. Sure, it gets yeah. just super hard because the, the context of the problem is big. It becomes social. It becomes um, meaningful. It becomes things that are unseen before. And so uh, we went from like, we're going to displace controllers to we're just going to fry them. Here's the runway you should go to and here's the plane you should follow. And just limiting the world and giving them a little advice um, based on what the computer could get the big picture, but and giving them control and thinking of it more as a, an advisor than a, a dictator, that became a, a very important um, uh, touchstone for me. And I, I see it now also in a lot of the talk in AI. It's, it's really easy to get a 80, 90% result, but to actually get it right. Like chat GPT, self-driving cars, it's like amazing, but then you're like, it's it's wrong. And like it, it's wrong at various times. And so it's just it's hard to get it um the, that sort of gap to making things that are actually um, competent as opposed to skilled are is it's really tough in AI. And, and so in some ways I got frustrated with that and I left. And so now that the AI is back, it sort of feels like it's the girlfriend I had in college who I dumped. Um, and now it's yeah. back as a major movie star. I'm like, Oh, miss that one. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Yeah. Cause you know, accuracy, right. Data quality is so important, right. Cause there's major consequences if it's not there in something like that. Yeah, it is. And, and it's also, I think, the idea of, of sort of magic and people like the idea of magic and AI and, and it can tell you and maybe AI is going to magically do. And a lot of vendors do push magic beans, which I think is unfortunate. Um, but I, I, I think like a lot of things, you can help people be more efficient in their job. You know, algorithms and AI in general can help people. Um, doing governance faster, do it creating. We have technology that you could broadly class as algorithms and AI to help people write automated data quality tests. Right? There's a lot of things that you can do, but it's it's an it's an advisor, not a dictator. It's always going to go wrong at some point, and you have to uh, monitor it and control it. And, and I think that's the the theme I learned in sort of ninety two, and here it is twenty twenty three, and it's the same. It's the same stuff, and I think it's going to be that way for a while. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that, you know. It's just more yeah. automation. Yeah, I agree. Okay, so where did you go to from there? Uh, from oh, so like I said, I I joined a couple of internet startups because it was. Mm -hmm. Um, some of which were terrible and some of which were interesting. Um, and uh, then uh, I, I decided more um, that I wanted to be a manager. And so uh, my mind worked faster than my fingers. And I was like, I, I, and that took me, I think like a lot of people in a technical role, um, I struggled with managing my first small team. And I went from kind of individual contributor to tech lead to, it took me a good um, eight, nine years to get that right out of my head. Um, because I was sort of the person I wanted to do two things. I wanted to be the person who wrote all the cool, cool stuff and did all the cool work and tell people what to do. And uh, I got a job where I was a director of engineering and managing a team and I stopped doing technical work. And I spent about a decade, honestly, just learning to be a good people manager. Um, and that's a very, um, some people annoyingly are like absolutely great at it. And like, they're just good at it. And it's like really annoying. They don't, aren't trained. They're just like so good at it. And like, it's just really drives me nuts. So I'm like, I'm married to one and she's really good at it, but she's a teacher. She doesn't want, I'm like, you have leadership skills coming out of, coming out of your sleeve. And I have to struggle to learn all these things. It's really annoying for that, but like, it can be learned. And that's, I think a problem with a lot of people in data or people who um, have these odd set of 2% skills where they can stare at a computer screen all the time and, and really get into it. It's very difficult then to take that knowledge and transfer it into leading teams or leading functions and organizations. It's a really different mindset. And it's like, it's like going from A to, it's going, it's like going from A to B or A to Z. It's just, it's so different that um, a lot of people struggle and, and uh, it took me a while. Was it just through experience and trial and error? Did you was there uh, trial and error and um, 
You know, there was a book, I don't know, 15 years ago called Emotional Intelligence um, that basically talked about this idea that you have intelligence, IQ and EQ, Mm -hmm. and that um, to manage people, it's all an EQ role. It's not an IQ role. And um, that was a big thing. And then I started to learn, I took some communication training classes, like how to deal with conflict, how to talk media training, like um, I started to do a lot of sales and um, communication became very important. Um, uh, And so, and in my role now, I think the biggest thing I do is I'm sort of chief storyteller. I I tell stories because Mm -hmm. probably the purpose of of why you want to solve a problem with technology or why should you stay at this company and go to somewhere else? Those are really important stories. And and a lot of times people aren't particularly, uh, we're very built to listen to stories and respond to stories as opposed to um, listening to sort of rational discussion or even thinking about data. And so, you know, uh, uh, which is odd thing to say, but I think that's, that's the way we're we're built as people. Yeah. So then where did you go from there? From your startups? Uh, uh, So I went, um, you know, I've, I, I've kind of stayed in this sort of um, Massachusetts startup ecosystem, right? So I was in a startup. And then I, in 2005, the startup that we, um, I, I'd met a guy through another person who was had a startup that did analytics for healthcare. And he was a doctor and he was struggling. He had a small company, a couple of people um, had um, and had bigger dreams. And um, I liked him because he built a company without any outside funding. He was a bootstrap guy and he, he was smart, went to Harvard Medical School. And so I worked with him for seven years and we built that company up to um, about 50 people and then we sold it. And it was really my first experience to data and analytics and, and as, as a full-time job. And I had, I had been a software person and software teams and I had software person arrogance. Um, and honestly, I took the job because my kids were like five and seven and I wanted to get, I, I wanted to eat, I wanted an easier job that I could like just do and like get home and play with the kids. And, and it turned out to be actually incredibly hard, right? Because things were breaking and we could never go fast enough. And so we had customers, you know, with thousands of people using our, our analytics and I was the chief operating officer. So I, people would call me when things would go wrong. And, mm-hmm. and I really, I didn't like that. Like when things go wrong and I, I would agree with them. They'd say, this is wrong. You're a moron. And I go, yeah, we are a moron. That is wrong. <laughs> and, uh, and I did like a lot of initial managers did. I sought to blame people. So I fired a bunch of people, probably, unjustly um because they like weren't working smart um and then things were still going wrong and the other part is we just we couldn't go fast enough for what our customers want like they wanted perfect insight in in terms of dashboards and we were integrating much of the data they wanted to have a bunch of questions like i had people who did data data engineering and data science and data visualization and business analysts all sort of working for me um and we just it, it really wasn't a great job because we were caught between the sort of Scylla and Charybdis, right? The Scylla of like errors and problems and incorrectness and the Charybdis of like, you can't go fast enough, right? We're caught, right? right? And like, and that's a very depressing position to be in, to be between something that uh, you're going to, you're going to fall off either way. And, um, you know, it's frustrated me, frustrated my wife, because I was complaining a lot and I like, there just had to be something here. And it was like, um, I, I started to think about what we did as a factory, right? I started to think about, okay, we're manufacturing insight. We're manufacturing data. What do people who've done manufacturing lines have done? So I went and read Deming and the Toyota production system and the machine that changed the world. And they had this very keen insight that floored me and said that 96% of the problems are in the system and not in the particular, not in the person. They're in... Mm -hmm. And who owns the whole system of work? Well, it's the leader, right? And so what I realized is that almost all of those things were my fault and I had to fix them. They weren't the fact that someone just wasn't working hard enough or we hired the wrong person. And that also sucked because I I realized that like I'd probably fired some people I shouldn't have because I just didn't know how to manage them. So I I started to, and this is like 2006, say, "Hmm, how do I adapt Toyota techniques? 
So we had a quality circle and every week we'd sit around and say, what went wrong? And we'd have a list and then we'd have one thing that we could do. And given my software background, it was do something. And it was a, uh, I was a believer in automation, like write, write some code to do it. Sometimes it was checklists that helped. Sometimes people forgot the checklist after a while, but like that, um, sort of, and then I realized I needed to have these phrases. So I had these, I started to use this term opportunity for improvement, like over and over and over again. And I had to get people to love their errors and um, realize instead of shrinking when things go wrong and blame to be able to be more um, open about problems and accepting. And so that took a while to break that out of the habit of like people wanting to hide their errors and, and the shame and blame. And, and also just even um, on the other side of it, trying to control people's heroism. Right, because a lot of people here, you're, you're in a customer success role. You want to help them, so you work all weekend. You give them what they want. That's great, but then you create a lot of what software engineers call technical debt. Um, and so, I guess uh, we, you know, I, 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 I made some progress. We were, had a sustainable company, and then it realized that the founders of the company were kind of getting tired, so we sold it. And, and it was a good uh, outcome for the founders. They, they didn't share it as much with our team as I wanted, but like, um, and then I wanted to start a company because I'd sort of been interested in entrepreneurship. And uh, two people uh, from that company joined me. And I think in the beginning, I think we realized that we weren't ever going to, um, we wanted to. F- make a company that was sort of in line with our values. We wanted to make a company that uh, we're big believers in like selling things and being able to get value. So we've never, we've always worked, uh, we never had any investors. We've always sort of grown with customer revenue. So we've still been, um, you know, a a profitable or mildly profitable company. Um, And so we've grown over the years since, and I think, um, that lesson of like having, uh, trying to, uh, have a company that's sort of in line with your values. And the other part is like, if we're going to, that data people all suffer the same thing that we did, right. They, they are, things are going wrong and breaking. They don't know why, um, they can't go fast enough for their customers. And like, you know, I said in my talk, like we did a survey two years ago and, it was actually a really good survey. I think it was sort of 700 people responded. We had a, a, a survey organization do it. So it was statistically valid. Um, and 96% of them said they wanted their job to come with a therapist because it was so stressful. And I was like, wow, it's not 100. So there's 4% again. That's improvement. <laughs> uh, and, and so I don't want to get people down on data, data careers because um, it does, when I bring this up, it, the sort of failure and error rates and lack of frustration that a lot of people have um, that you even see talking to people at the data diversity conference. I, I think there's just a way out. And I think the way out is, is, is to focus on uh, improving the system that you work in. It's a, the, the, it, focusing on work processes instead of the process of work. Um, and, and so I think that's really um, the what we've been preaching and we have got some software to back it up um, to help uh, help make that happen. And so that, that's sort of been the mission is like to relieve the suffering that I felt in 2005 that I see generally people have um, and build a company in, in line with our values. Um, towards that mission. And we've been pretty consistent from that in the last 10 years. Uh, and, and I think, you know, we've had some successes. We're not a 2000 person company. So, you know, you can make your judgments on whether that's successful or not, but I, this is the mission I believe in. And, um, you know, I have good days and bad days. I'm about rather, you know, some days I, at the last day diversity event, I hear some, um, you know, I was in a, and maybe this is too, maybe I shouldn't say this, but I was in a data products discussion. And, and you had those wrap sessions or some small special interest group discussions. And they were talking about data products. And they were very, everyone was saying data products is a what? Well, it's a what? A data product is a database full of stuff. A data product is a report. A data product is a virtualization thing. And I'm like, uh, no, a data product is a how, not a what. It's a how you do things. It's a how you focus on the iterative delivery to your customer. You want to work on a product that's that's always improving, not a project that's done. Mm-hmm. And then there's this book in software development by Mick Kirkston called Project the Product. 
that I think encapsulates that idea. And so I, I get a little depressed sometimes because like people, data people are very focused on the what and not the how, and the how is the real problem and that there's a lot of opportunity for us to do more good what stuff if we just focus for a while on improving our how. Well, I'm glad you attended that special interest group. I mean, that's the point of those discussions, right? To have those debates and, and get somebody's perspective to kind of start challenging the norm, right? Like, and yeah, yeah, no, and, and people, I brought yeah. it up and people, people agreed. And like, you yeah. know, I, 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 the reason I say that is I've just been talking about this same idea for 10 years. And like, I hear, I'm like, why, I, well, why aren't, you know, I'm an engineer. I'm like, yeah. I, I mean, I figured it out. Why haven't you? And that's like one of the biggest problems in for technical people is like what seems obvious to us isn't always obvious to other people and it's crystal clear in my mind yeah. um, but like you've got to communicate it and persuade and get people on the path and that that takes time and change and that's in any career if you're going to yeah. lead and not be an individual contributor um uh persuasion and discussion and uh, empathy for people, I think is really important uh, because everyone's got a lot going on. And a lot of times people who are, who come from a technical background tend to bonk. They tend to go like, oh, I just can't stand how stupid these people are. You know, you, they're like, why, this is obvious to me. Why are they doing all this dumb stuff? And then they, they quit or they change careers or something. And so I think that's uh, a really important a lesson for anyone who's in data is, is um, that we're kind of in the, the influence business, right? We're influencing people with data. And so, you know, we use technology to do that influence. And if you're going to try to influence people to take, to not make intuitive decisions, in the, that's an influencing job. Yeah. You know, I, I, uh, it's, I think, you know, it just is not just in data. I think it's in any career and it's just a human thing. Right. I mean, I have, I had to learn that lesson. I, you know, I'm like, why doesn't anybody understand this very important thing that is so clear to me and so easy for me to understand? But then, you know, I have had the opposite experience, right? Somebody come to me and they're who like, Shannon, why aren't you understanding this? This is so clear to me. This is, I'm like, but that's not the way my brain works. <laughs> that's just, you yeah. know, but because, you know, we all have those strengths and, and can share those different things. So with, like you say, with empathy and patience, then we can share and build and you know and capitalize on those those strengths from each of us right yeah yeah and like like i appreciated you introduced yourself at the conference i spaced your face i was like shannon i thought you were like i don't know who you were i was like i had no idea who she was i thought you were someone i worked with 10 years ago and i was <laughs> like I, like blank and you were very kind to me while i while my brain sort of snapped in and said, oh, okay, who, this is who you are. Um, and, <laughs> and so I appreciate yeah. that. And, but that's a really, that's a good skill, you know, and like, um, uh, I, I think it is. And that's, if you're going to, um, now, if you're, it, it's certainly a good skill. We need people who are focused nine to five on technical things. Mm -hmm. Right. However, Absolutely. even if you're going to do that, if you're going to do SQL work or data science work full time, mm -hmm. you work with others who are a lot of things that you build together are collaborative efforts. Mm -hmm. And we all kind of work on this shared, technically complicated thing. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and it's very rare that someone does something that makes an impact just by themselves. You're part of a team building something. And what is that you build? Well, it's a data warehouse with a set of reports. It's a well-governed data governance system. It's a software product. It's a car. And I think from my standpoint, this activity of having sort of socially awkward, technically skilled, high abstraction people work on a shared, technically complicated, shared thing, shared complicated thing. There is a management set, set of ideas on how to, how to do that. That's probably very different than, you know, managing a play or managing, um, you know, managing data diversity, right? And, and I think the principles, there are principles of like, you know, run it with metrics and, and try to search for bottlenecks in the system, yeah. having a uh, searching for errors, looking for waste, uh, honesty. Um, I think are, are 
invariant of whether it's like a, you're making a car or making software or delivering insight to your customer. These principles kind of apply. And I, that's my sort of belief that th those things work and you don't need to reinvent the wheel and data is not different. Data is just another sheer technically complicated thing like software manufacturing and uh, and get over it and stop being a hero or stop being a hero and working nights and weekends. Only do that once in a while and stop being um, fearful and hiding under your process and not delivering value or putting your head in the sand. And so this is my role. I don't know what else is there. You know, your job is yeah. to influence your customer and you're part of a team and uh, and your product that you deliver in any form is what what matters in the world and just because your piece works if it's not used um yeah. it's not great it, you haven't done your, you haven't done a job and so that's a that's a yeah. like that perspective of like focus on customer value and 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 make them successful um is really that's really what it matters and that's what i i want more people to talk about and less talk about data products data mesh data fabric data lake house, technology du jour, the sort of techno fetishism that happens, I think is just not, not useful or, um, but you know, that, I, that so customers, that, that's where I, I am. And, and, and um, I think I'm right, but I, I, I don't think it's standard practice yet in data analytics. Visit dataversity.net and expand your knowledge with thousands of articles and blogs written by industry experts, plus free live and on-demand webinars covering the complete data management spectrum. While you're there, subscribe to the weekly newsletter so you'll never miss a beat. So you, you've mentioned, I mean, these are a lot of great lessons and, and a real, this passion comes seems to come from some lessons that you've learned along the way and your own challenges, you know, so what has been your biggest lesson so far in your career? What was, you know, was it this or, or was it something that influenced this or? Biggest lesson. Um, oh, I mean, personal lesson is, is just, uh, I can work on it and I got to continue to work on it. It's the, it's the sort of growth mindset, the cycles, the, the cycles of your own failure and growth are like, mm -hmm. are kind of continual in your life. Mm -hmm. And, um, if you, you know, if you, th this, if you try, you have a risk of failure and like, mm -hmm. um, and trying is all sorts of forms, talking to someone you wouldn't want to talk to, um, trying a new thing, changing a job, starting a company, talking on a podcast. They're all like these things that we try and like we learn and we don't quite do it right. Um, but like, but at the end we, we learn and grow. And so I think the, the uh, sort of iterative growth mindset, I think is a really powerful thing. And also the forgiveness of your own failures is a really good thing to do. Um, and if you can do that, uh, and be somewhat optimistic that, things, even if, cause I'm a sort of a pessimist, sort of trained optimism and, and, and trained, um, uh, growth mindset. And if I can keep doing that, things get better, not always not perfect, but like they get better. And, and so you can, um, um, you can keep that and applies to relationships and a lot of different things. So just, just swing, keep swinging the bat at things and you're eventually going to hit something. <laughs> I love that. Uh, I think uh, that's, what it is. That, that's like, if, if any career lesson, it's like, yeah. you are going to have bosses that suck. You are going to have, like, I've had jobs where I, within three weeks, I realized I made a huge mistake. Mm -hmm. This is not good. And it's going to be bad. And like, I don't want to look for a job. I'm, I'm going to be here for a year. This isn't good. Or I've realized that I'm on a project and it's just, it's not working and it's going to, it's, it's bad. And, uh, and we need to back out of this and, and I've had things that are great and that I love. Right. And, and like, we're going to have swings and, and sometimes the bad things happen you step back and realize, yeah, that was my fault. Um, and what can I learn from it and how do I, um, and, and I think any leadership, any position in anything means that you're the person who sort of goes in the cave and finds the bad thing and says, here's the bad thing. And this bad thing could happen. And like, maybe we shouldn't have done that, or maybe we, we have to do this to avoid it. Very much so. Um, oh, thank you. I, I love that. And thanks for sharing those challenges too. And um, so 
Chris, tell me, I mean, you, you've worked with data a lot uh, throughout your career, really from the beginning of your career. So what is your definition of data? <laughs> the definition of data? Um, mm -hmm. Well, it's sort of quantitative measure measurements of stuff that happens in the world, right? I, I think that's the way I think of it. It's um, sort of like the, the the reflection in Plato and Mino's cave, right? It's the reflection of what happened. It's not reality. It's a reflection of reality, right? And so um, uh, it, in that sense, I think data is um, a way to perceive the world that is some can be accurate and can be inaccurate. Um, but it is a way to help you, um, it, it is a tool to help you make better decisions about your life and your business or your activity. And so, but it's not the only tool. And so what I found is that, um, most people, and I've worked mostly in sort of business and government contexts, I've worked in others, but people look at data in many different ways as part of that, but sometimes they look at data as a self, as a thing to justify their intuitions. I already know what I'm going to do. I'm going to find in the data where it is other, you know, I think other people look at the data more directly and say, okay, it, it disconfirms and then they change their mind. Um, and, um, but it's part of the process of, of decision and change. And, and it's only part of it because there's intuition, there's experience, there's mm -hmm. peer pressure, there's theories of the world. And like human decision-making is sort of super, super uh, flexible in that way. Um, so data is part of it, but it, it can play a really strong part in how people make, uh, make decisions. And, you know, I think um, likewise, I think it also has the same uh, as I've seen, the data career in the sort of 18 years that I've been in it go from, it's really gone from in a lot of ways as furniture in, in organizations. It's like, Oh, show me the data. Okay. It's like, I'm seeing a chair. It's like, okay, we got to have data um, to actually having power and the sort of money ball idea. That's, that's a really interesting change um, data as power and co companies that have gotten very big and influential because of their, their data that they have, you know, specifically the big um, consumer internet companies. Um, and so that's also a, another definition of data is data has power um, mm. that I think um, is, can, it can cut both ways. And so we have to, we have to sort of put our moral lens on it as well and, and treat it as something that, that can be misused uh, as well as used for good things. I couldn't agree more. Couldn't agree more. Yeah, it's so very true. So, and and as we, you know, the this data becomes more mainstream, where more companies are focusing on it. You know, do you see the importance of data management and the number of jobs working with data increasing or decreasing in the next ten years, and why? I guess I I see that. Everyone who has a part of the company should be using data in some way, right? Um, whether you're uh, working in a consumer business and you've got your retail store, whether you're a teacher, part of your work should be um, maybe not every day, but part of your work should involve reflecting on what the data is telling you and, and how that can do it. And so there are always going to be groups of people who are in, who are in charge of the cult of data and, and integrating it, explaining it, improving upon it, um, sharing it. Like, and so I think those jobs are really important, right? And so I think they are not going to decrease. Um, and I, I do think even though teams are woefully inefficient, I think, and there's a huge opportunity for teams to get 10 times more efficient. Um, I, I think those jobs are going, going to increase. And I think there's a superpower that I've found is that if people who can kind of, people who can talk, can think, and who can, I guess, I, I think of it as code, but really do data, uh, mm -hmm. do data, code, think, and talk. Like that's, if you can do those three things, you are... Because a lot of people can talk, but they can't think. Yeah. Some people can think yeah. and they can't talk and can't code. You know, some people can code and they can't, you know, so like you got all three, you're like, you're like the superpower and like you're, you're, you're set. Yeah. <laughs> um. Well, that's, and that's a really nice segue into my next question, Chris, because, you know, you know, if 
as people are looking to get into careers in data, and there's so many different aspects of it. So wherever yeah. you want to focus, um, you know, is is that is you know how would what advice would you give to people looking into it? Would you like say hone all those three skills, or or what advice would you give? Yeah. Um, that's interesting. So there's a story. So um, yeah, my daughter has a, her, her boyfriend. Her boyfriend just started teaching uh, at a college, and he's he's kind of a he's teaching sort of data science, computer science, and he has a sort of a, a, a data analytics class for business majors. And he gave his first test, and he goes, "Yeah, I got scores from twenty to a hundred, and like, what do I do with that?" And I was like, I was not at all surprised because people who are in non-technical fields who score a hundred and it's like super easy for them. They're like, they don't even know why they like to just, they look at it and it makes sense for them. And like, if that's part of your makeup, that's a good thing. It just sort of makes sense to you and you can use that. And a lot of people in data come into that where they're the ones who are just interested in it. They get the data in the spreadsheet and they look at it. They understand the data. They start doing it on weekends and, um, and they find that that is a that's a skill and you should um not everyone has it and it's not that you're in some ways it makes you like we all have different skills right but it's it's sort of a unique skill that you can that you can hang hang your hat on and and, and go with and so um if you can couple that with sort of influence skills and, and certainly technical skills, because there's a lot, like if you go from sort of Excel hacking to Tableau to trying to do data management in the database to data governance, those are all really good things. Um, and uh, I think those are, are important. Um, there are some anti-patterns in, in careers in data about people who get really focused and know every their company data and then just get all bitter because no one's listening to them. Um, uh, but like, I, I, th I think it's a great career. I, I find there's a lot more women than men and like there's just way too many men in software. So it's, there's, and I've been <laughs> personally trying to recruit more women for years and it's like impossible because only 20% of the soft the computer science graduates are women at any time. And so it's yeah. a lot more female friendly. It's a lot more mix of this talking to people and doing technical things. Um, mm -hmm. And if you if you can sort of have a business sense and couple that with technical skills and understanding data, that's also a really a superpower. Like if that's that's really good because it's a in some ways looking at a business through its data is sort of an X-ray. It's kind of an X-ray vision. Right. And, and um, like I once one of our friends is a teacher and she wanted me to come talk about business. Uh, to third graders. And I said, put your, go into a store and put your x-ray glasses on, try to figure out where they're making all their money. And like, mm -hmm. yeah, those bits of candy right by the cash register that cost a dollar, that's where they're making their money because it really costs them three cents. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Why are some things higher and lower? Why are some things on the end and not? Mm -hmm. Like, oh, yeah. where do people really like why well, you know to, restaurants make all their monies off of drinks not the food like you got to look for where the margin is generated and it's like a um you know i, I think um data is like that it's kind of like a, a if you can you, it gives you a sort of an x-ray into a truth about an organization and that's that's a very um important thing for organizations to have so there'll always be and there always need people to do that because yeah. most people kind of don't want to do that the results and if you can help, you can really help an organization by being part of a team that is able to give that company X-ray vision and influence um, the organization to um, the right way. Yeah. Oh, so good. Well, Chris, I would be remiss if I didn't ask if people wanted to learn more about Data Kitchen, how where would they go? Uh, simple, datakitchen.io. And mm -hmm. data is just the one word, data, just Google Data Kitchen. And uh, we have... If you're interested in some of these ideas of analytic agility, um, data ops, lean, we have actually two books that are free for download on data ops, um, several hundred pages. Um, we've had over 30,000 people um, download them. Uh, wow. We have a training program, a free certification program in data ops that we've had over, over 3,000 people take. Um, if you enjoy listening to me more on, on, in a tape format. Um, uh, we have... Uh, um, a manifesto uh, of 18 points that you can look at and sign. So we have a lot of content um, that helps because I think fairly early to this idea. So we had to create a lot of ideas. And now 
there's a lot more companies talking about testing and observability and agility and data and analytics, which is great. Um, but you know, one of the challenges of being early is that you know, we had to, yeah, you know, like I, when I went to my first, when I talked about these ideas at the first data diversity conference, no one knew what I was talking about. It'd be like some guy seven, eight years ago, like, what? <laughs> What do you do? What are you talking about? <laughs> so it's a little people know a little bit more now, so which is great. They do, yeah, yeah, indeed. And, and I have to ask, Chris. You know, you are in addition to just being CEO, you're you're head chef. So does everybody at the company have these fun names, fun titles? <laughs> um, no, not really. <laughs> uh, I, I like it because I, you know, we like good data people. We made a spreadsheet of company names. Uh, uh, yeah. And like good business people, we we had a couple of ones that didn't work um, that were too technical or like, yeah. uh, you know, and then as so we finally settled on kitchen because it's fun. And also because it's, um, you know, if you've eaten at a, a good restaurant, the work that a team of people does in a kitchen is mm -hmm. um is really important. Right. And, it, and it's a lot like a data team. Right. Because you want to consistently put out the dishes on your menu with high quality, right? right. And you want to man maintain lots of variations of them because somebody's going to be a, a vegetarian or not like cheese on their, you know, on their, on their dinner. Right. Um, but then you also have to create new stuff because you have to create new menu items. So consistency, mm -hmm. low errors, but you have to be able to change things rapidly or create new things. And that metaphor, I think, really applies to data and analytic teams. You have to put out high quality results, but you have to respond to what customers request and, and create very rapidly so you can um, improve um, your learning. And, and, and that, so I think the, the kitchen is a good metaphor, the team. And so I yeah. think that's, I think it's a good name in that, that way. Um, and, and it's people, and it's fun. It's less boring than like, we had some very technical sounding names and they were like, yeah, who wants another technical nerd sounding company, you know? So <laughs> <laughs> I love it as a great metaphor. And, and so datakitchen.io, check it out. Uh, well, Chris, it's been such a pleasure. Thank you so much for taking the time to join with us today. All right. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. And to all of our listeners out there, if you'd like to keep up to date in the latest podcast and in the latest in data management education, you may go to dataversity.net forward slash subscribe. Until next time, stay curious, everyone. Thank you for listening to Dataversity Talks, a podcast brought to you by Dataversity. Subscribe to our newsletter for podcast updates and information about our free educational webinars at dataversity.net forward slash subscribe.